Um, I hope you've had a good rest. So we can carry on with the more intense stuff. I'd just like to go over where I started off, so just to give some background. We started off by doing this uh, example here. And from this, we <clears throat> came to a couple of conclusions. One is that stocking rate is by far the most important <coughs> determinant of ranch profitability. If you look here, in these two examples here, we had a lowering of stocking rate, but an increase, uh, sorry, a lowering of, increase in stocking rate, and a lowering of your carving rate and weaning weights, we still made much more money here. Your gro total gross margin here <coughs> was 150,000 as opposed to 200,000 here. But even more important than that is the return on capital investment was much higher, or relatively higher here, with a lower performance per animal. So that shows you that the more animals you carry, even if they produce individually at a lower level, your total profitability will be higher. The reason being is that we have such a high capital investment in land prices as opposed to cattle prices. But if you have a combination of very high stocking rates and high performance per animal in terms of body condition, which relates to calving rate, then you come to these figures here that are two to three times higher than what you get in the conventional system here. So if a conventional system uh, where the, the objective is maximum profit per animal or production per animal has to compete with our system which is based on maximum sustainable profit per hectare or per acre, it means that in the conventional system you would have to start getting twins and triplets as the case is here. So that just puts the whole th picture into perspective how important stocking rate is, even with a low production per animal. But there are various ways we, how we can increase the production per animal. One is through breeding, genetics. The other one is through managing them with more paddocks per herd. The more paddocks we have per herd, the, the less the drop in uh, body condition will be. Uh, increasing or improving your supplementation. And the fourth one, which is extremely important, is synchronizing production with seasonal variation in nutrition. In other words, rather carving in summer than in the middle of winter. The production costs are going to be much lower, and I'll explain that a little bit later, how, how great the difference will be. So what we have to understand very clearly is that cattle have a dual role. One is that they have to improve the land on which they graze. And that is what Jaime talked about yesterday, where we have to increase the density, stock densities, decrease the selectivity of grazing as much as possible, and then uh, manage time in relation to your environment for the, uh, the grasses to recover, or to keep nutrition high. You have to manage time. Okay. The other role that cattle have, which is very important, is that they have to convert grass efficiently into beef, or milk if you're a dairy man. And the problem is with our current selection criteria and breeding and management practices is that we breed cattle that require improved nutrition in order to be productive. All our cattle can be productive, but some of them you'll have to put in a feedlot to be able to carve every single year. So what we require to do, what we have to do is, we have to breed cattle that under poorer nutrition can still ha have inherently good body condition, and that will relate to higher productivity and particularly fertility. So what I want to like to show you here, and I'm going to go over very quickly again, what we have here, we have two variables, the size of the animal and then the growth rate, the daily growth rate. Okay, so those are two variables, and the figures here in blue relate to the amount of energy required for one kilogram of grain in this case here, or a pound of grain if you haven't metricated yet. Okay, so basically the higher the figure is, the least efficient that conversion is relative to the size of the animal and the growth rate. And from, these, from what we can see here, the conclusions are very important for us to understand. One is that the faster an individual animal grows, the more efficient that growth is. Whether it's a large animal or a small animal, the faster an individual animal grows, the more efficient that growth is. And the reason is that the faster it grows, there's less maintenance requirement for that growth. If this animal is gaining 0.1 kilogram a day, it requires 10 days of maintenance to achieve a, a total of one kilogram of gain. Whereas here, where it's gaining one kilogram a day, it only requires one day of maintenance. And that is why there is such a big difference. So growth rate is extremely important. But does that mean that the fastest growing animal is the most efficient? 
No, it doesn't. Because we have to take size into consideration. If you look here at a similar growth rate, equal growth rate, and we go across and look at size of the animal, you'll see that the larger the animal at, at an equal growth rate, similar growth rate, the less efficient that growth is. So there's a relationship between required growth and size for equal efficiency. Okay, so if an animal is a, of a larger frame size, at any age it has to be heavier in terms of weight or it has to grow faster. And if we look here, this example here, we have a 200, 300, 400, 500 kilogram animal. Each has to grow in 0.2. If this animal of 200 is gaining 0.2 kilograms a day, a 300 kilogram animal has to gain 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and 0.5. You can see that's equal efficiency. So what that means is that the, the required growth rate is in direct proportion to size. So if an animal is 50% larger, as you will get in, in a, any herd, you'll probably get a 30 to 50% uh, variation in cow size. If there's a 30% variation in cow size between cows, then the progeny of the one cow or that cow has to grow 30% faster or weigh 30% more at any given age to be equally, equally efficient. It's very clear from these figures here. The problem is that although animals have to grow in proportion to the size to be equally efficient, they can't eat in proportion to the size. As we saw the other day, I explained to you, if you look at all the mammals in the world, your elephant and rhino on one side and your mice and rabbits on the one side, the smaller animals have a faster um, maturity rate, faster reproduction rate. And the reason being is that as an animal gets larger, within, between species or even within a species or within a herd, the larger animals uh, have a lower relative intake. In other words, although they might eat more grass, the intake relative to size is lower. And that is because intake is relative not to size but to metabolic size, which is a function of size. What it means is that the larger the animals, the, lo the, le the uh, smaller the metabolic size is relative to the weight of the animal. Let me just explain that quickly here. Here you have a variation in size from 300 to, five to 600 kilograms. Okay? What you have here is the metabolic size, which is the function of size, uh, the weight of the animal to the power of 0.75. Don't be intimidated by those figures. So what that means is that the metabolic size of a 300 kilogram cow is 72, and that of a 600 is 120. You see, 70, 120 is not double 72. So as the animal gets larger, becomes bigger, genetically it's unable to take in, uh, um, uh, as much grass relative to its size. So the intake is less. So that's why we're talking about the relative intake for a small animal is much larger than for a large animal. And the difference between a 300 and 600 is in favor of the, the 300 kilogram by 20%. If you see, look at this figure here, we have arbitrarily uh, placed the relative intake of 100 on a large cow. On a small cow, it's 120. In other words, the relative intake, or the intake relative to size, for the small cow, which is half the size of that cow, is 20% more. That means that your body condition is going to be 20% more. So 2.4 multiplied by 1.2 gives you this figure of 2.9. And that body condition is what determines the reconception or the fertility rate of a cow. And a 2.9 body condition on a score of 1 to 5 would be equivalent to 90% calving rate, and a 2.4 would be equivalent to 70% calving rate. So what it means is that the small frame cow has an unfair advantage, and that unfair advantage is in terms of intake. And that is why, if you look at any herd, your smaller frame cows have better body condition. And your large frame cow is genetically handicapped. It's a genetic factor in her makeup that she's not able to take in more relative to her size in relation to a small cow. So that's very important to understand those. We don't have to go into too much detail, but understand those principles. If I can just go back to the other graph again here, yeah? just to explain to you. Let's take for argument's sake that you have a, a, a cow herd with average size is 400 kilograms in terms of frame size. Remember what I'm, the, the kilogram figure here I'm talking about might be a little bit dis, uh, misleading. I'm actually talking about frame size, but it's easier for us to understand in terms of kilograms. But your smaller frame animal will be heavier 
relative to your frame size because he's got a higher intake. So I'm not suggesting we uh, select smaller cattle or lighter cattle. I'm suggesting we se uh, select more efficient cattle which will be heavier relative to their frame size. And that is the selection criteria I'm going to talk about later identifies those animals. Okay, now let's just assume we have an average herd size or cow size of 400. I'm sure you'll agree with me that some cows will weigh 300 and some will weigh 500. So we will have that variation more or less in any herd. Now if you're selecting bulls from a cow herd like that, and you don't take size into consideration, you have a problem. If we just looked at growth rate, and we, we took three cows here, and I told you the growth rate of one bull from weaning to 12 months was 0.5 of a kilogram, and another, the growth rate of another bull would have been uh, 0.8 kilograms. Which bull would we select? The one that grew 0.8 or 0.5? Obviously, in current terms, we select a 0.8 kilogram bull. Now, let's look at it. Let's assume now that the 0.5 growth rate bull came from a 300 kilogram cow. The efficiency there would be 112 in terms of what we've done here. And the 0.8 would be from a 500 kilogram cow would be 122. So although the animal is going faster, it's still less efficient. So we have to select for efficiency. And there you can see the relationship between size and required growth rate for equal efficiency. So it's something we have to get into our heads that size has to be considered in terms of size or growth rate has to be considered in terms of size. Weaning weight has to be considered in terms of size. Everything has to be relative, not absolute. If we go for absolute measures and we use EPDs to make those measurements more accurate, the problem is that all we're going to do is we're going to end up at the wrong uh, uh, end point much quicker. It's the same as accelerating the speed of a car on the wrong road. So the problem is the selection criteria that are inappropriate. Our current selection criteria are totally inappropriate in terms of grass conversion efficiency or productivity. So we have to devise other selection criteria. Another example of showing how, we, how incorrect, our, inappropriate our selections are, if you again look at the different cow sizes here, from 300 to 600, and that, that figure here is the equivalent, equally efficient uh, weaning weight relative to the cow size. In other words, a 300 kilogram cow weaning 150 kilogram calf is as efficient as a 600 kilogram cow weaning a 250 kilogram calf, not 300. Because the difference is related to grass intake. The 600 kilogram cow doesn't take in twice as much grass as a 300 kilogram cow. It takes in 67% more, not 100% more. That is why this figure here, if you multiply 150 by 1.67, you'll get that figure of 250. So that's equal. Uh, efficiency at weaning. Now the problem is we select a bull that at weaning weighs 250 kilograms as opposed to a bull that weighs 187 kilograms. Now that bull has to produce female progeny that we have to use to convert grass and to, uh, to produce calves. So fertility is very important. So if I'm going to breed at 15 months to calve at two years, more or less at, at yearling age, those heifers have to be 60% mature. In other words, they have to have achieved about 60% of the mature size. So what it means is that the 600 kilogram cow's heifer progeny, weaning at 250, has to gain 110 kilograms because that is the yearling weight that's required, is 360. And that's a tall order. This one here, a 400 kilogram cow in the same herd, weans a calf 187, and it only has to gain 53 kilograms to reach a mature size or 60% mature size. The difference between that is twice. So this heifer has to grow twice as fast. Now, under difficult conditions or poor nutrition, or where you're putting pressure on your cattle to graze select non-selectively, this animal will be unable to achieve that unless you put a lot of extra inputs into it in terms of feed. This one has a far better chance of achieving it. So the problem is that we're selecting cattle that require better nutrition in order to be productive. We have to select cattle that are efficient grass converters, regardless of size. You might get a, it's unlikely, but you might get a, a very efficient animal in a larger frame size, but generally speaking, they will be in a lower frame size, not necessarily the smallest. So we're not selecting for smaller frame cattle, we're only selecting for more efficient cattle. 
And because of the relationship between frame size and intake, the more efficient cattle will be in the smaller frame category. If you wane the calf at nine months, do you have kind of rules on what percent of the mama's weight it ought to be? <clears throat> at nine months, I would say, you see, if you, the problem is with, with cows, uh, and I've had it in my own herd, is you have some cows that just have too much milk. So I've had cows that produce th uh, calves at nine months, three quarters of their own weight. That's far too much milk. Because when you put pressure on those cows to graze non-selectively, or it's a poor environment, those are the first cows that don't reconceive. I would say as a rule of thumb, about 50% is appropriate. Around about 50%. To, from 50% to 60% at yearling is not a, a tall order. And the other thing is that your, sm your smaller frame cows will be able to achieve 50% in relation to their size, cow, calf weight, with less milk than the larger cow. The larger cow has to have much more milk, because remember her intake is less, so she will have to have much more milk, and that will reflect negatively on her body condition. So it's much easier to achieve that 50% with a smaller frame cow than with a large frame cow. What I'd like to just uh, uh, show you here is that we talked earlier about uh, the importance of stocking rate. It's by far the most important uh, determinant of ranch profitability. But you also, if you're a cow-calf producer, then calving rate, fertility, is, is an extremely important characteristic. So if you combine those two, that's when you get these VR returns in your capital investment. Okay, now, if you had 100 cows that were equally fertile, in other words, you had 100 cows that are 10 years of age, each produced nine calves. We discussed that earlier. Are those 100 cows equally fertile or not? In terms of the phenotype, what we can see and what we can measure, they are equally fertile because they have a 100% calving record. But the history determines what the calving record is. In other words, if you decrease your calving uh, season or breeding season from, say, 90 days to 42 days, you wouldn't have a 100% calving record. In other words, what will happen is you have a group of cows starting at the bottom here that will start falling out. They wouldn't be able to reconceive again. And if you made conditions so difficult that only 10% of your cows remained, then you'd be able to identify the 10% that are genetically extremely fertile. And what this means is the genetic fertility of those cattle, it means basically two things. They have a very good hormonal balance, the sex hormones relative to the growth hormones, and they have inherently good body condition. In other words, even under very difficult conditions, the body conditions were such that they were still able to reconceive. Now, in any herd, all of us that produce cattle here, every one of us, in all our herds, there are cattle, cows in that category. Whether we know it or not, and despite our um, inappropriate breeding uh, practices, we do have cattle in that category here. Okay. Now, the challenge is, if we want to select for fertility, and, and fertility, in this sense, is highly irritable if you can identify those cows. The problem with the current selection criteria is that uh, the variation in terms of fertility that's measured is largely environmental and not genetic. So we have to identify the genetic variation. Does everyone understand that? It's very important. If you don't understand it, please ask me and I can explain it again. So what it means is that animals you want to identify would be that 10 or 20% left behind in the herd where you made conditions so difficult that only 10% or 20% remain in the herd. But we want to be do, able to do that without putting too much pressure on the cattle. In other words, we still have to make money. There's no point in having only 10% of your cows left every year after, after you put them to the bull. You still ideally would want as many cows as possible to carve and still be able to put them in these categories. In other words, rank them in terms of fertility. So that is our challenge. You're going, to, you're going to do that by uh, adjusting the amount of nutrition or uh, supplement that you give them? No, that is the one way, Mark. I, I said, if you, if you make conditions so difficult, yes, you would be able to uh, identify them. But if we did that, it's, it's not practically possible to, to maintain your herd size. I understand. Okay. Now, the challenge we have is, and we can do it, is to identify those cars without making conditions so difficult. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's the challenge. We'll come to that, and I'll explain how we do that. Sorry, yeah. Now, we'll come to that. I thought, you were, I thought that if you were in, in let's say, in very uh, 
bad conditions that you did it by lowering uh, the supplementation a little yeah. so that you can see those cows fall out. Well, no, no, no. I said um, there are two options. One, one is that option, yeah. which isn't, which isn't uh, practically feasible. The other one is to do it where most of the cattle carve, have a perfect carving record, and you still be able to identify it. Okay. And that is what I'll explain later how we do that. Yeah. So that's a big breakthrough to be able to do that. So if we can identify these cows here, then obviously we can start selecting for fertility. If we can identify our top 10, 20, or 30% cows, and we select bulls out of those cows, then we're halfway to achieving what we want to achieve in terms of uh, uh, selecting for fertility. The, 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 the thing I was, I was I'd like to point out as well is that with current selection criteria, we can't do that. So it's not the criteria, it's not the, the characteristic of fertility that's lowly irritable. How can fertility be lowly irritable? If it, that was the case, then survival of the fittest wouldn't apply. Okay. But all the textbooks and all the academics will tell you that fertility is lowly irritable. But still, you must select for it. Now, I don't understand how they mean by that. If a, if a trait is lowly irritable, how do you select for it? So there's confusion there. I understand what the confusion is. So we have to identify criteria that are genetically discerning and use them to select for fertility. Okay. The other point I'd like to make is that although we have these very fertile cows in a herd, what are the chances that we have a bull that matches our most fertile cow in terms of fertility? It's very, very unlikely in terms of today's selection criteria. We will probably have a bull in this category here of 70% for fertility if you had to rank him as opposed to cows 190 and 80. So what you'll get is here, all your better cows, the progeny will go down in terms of uh, their fertility or, or uh, value or whatever you like to look at. And your poorer cows will go up. So the best we're doing currently is we're going to a mediocre average. What we need to do is we need to identify bulls that complement those best cows. Then we bring up the whole herd towards our better cows. So that is a challenge. Okay, so how do we do that? That's what we're here to learn. Uh, how do we identify that? Well, a shorter breeding season is essential. We can, we can, we can plan the short breeding season. Uh, since 1986, I've been breeding for just 42 days in a tropical environment, uh, in a very short window period opportunity we have. So that it, it's important to have a short breeding season, but that's not going to help. Uh, as such, we still have to identify those cows in the, in the short breeding season. Okay. Uh, any idea of what criteria we can use to measure fertility? Cow fertility. Okay, well, what's, what's, what's currently, what, what currently are uh, the measurements they use, the criteria they use in terms of conventional selection? What criteria is used? I mean, fertility is the most important trait. Everyone agrees that. But with conventional selection, what is used to select for fertility? Yeah, I'm talking about conventional. If you had EPDs, if you looked at EPDs, you don't worry about EPDs. Well, that's, that's a good sign. I know of no EPD that's accurate in terms of measuring it. Skirtle circumference, they do measure, but what does that mean? Actually, one of the things we use that I'm learning is not correct is uh, the ones that have the biggest calves. No. Yeah. You know, that, so that's, that's something that we can use. Okay, well, currently, I think we all agree there's no, there's no criteria or selection criteria being used that is genetically discerning in terms of fertility. If you use calving rate, if 80% or 90% of your cows carve every year, you can throw out 10%, but what about the other 90%? They also vary, so we can't identify them. So we might select a bull in the bottom category as opposed to the top category. So we have to use selection criteria. Are you familiar with inter-carving periods? Do you use them, or are you familiar with them? Do you know what they mean? Uh, yeah. I know what it means from looking at your charts. Okay, it's between two dates, carving dates. Okay, now that's a starting point. If we looked at in the carving period, or we looked at the period from carving to first heat cycle, which is a bit difficult to do, but we can do, do that. Because your inter carving period would depend on that. So if a cow cycles very quickly after uh, she's carved, 
then she, she will automatically have a shorter intercoring period if the bull is there available to serve her. Okay, so that's one way of doing it. So let's look at intercoring period, which is a easy, uh, much easier way of measuring it. So it's a, carve, it's a period between two successive carving dates. And what I suggest is, ideally we should do it between, with heifers that are carving for the first time and the second time. Because that'll be a contemporary group, have they had the same treatment, Let me just draw you a couple of um, figures here. Now what I'm going to do here, I'm going to show you my figures from my environment. And I'm going to, on the, uh, the, the months I'm going to put in both Southern Hemisphere and Northern Hemisphere. So that you'll be able to relate to that. Southern Hemisphere, the figures I'm going to put in, will be from Ju uh, June. To June there and the northern hemisphere will be December to December. Centering here in the middle on January in the southern hemisphere which is the middle of our rainy season and more or less July here would, is more or less the middle of your rainy your growing season as well. Okay. Now what I'm going to do here, one has to be very uh, careful uh, to understand that environments differ so much in terms of nutrition that the graph I'm going to draw, draw here um, there are certain aspects that will be applicable in your environment and my environment. But in my environment, there's a very small opportunity for me to have a uh, carve at the right time of the year. In your environment, it's a little bit different. So what I'm going to do here is, I'm going to write on the left-hand side here, I'm going to write the intercarving periods. So that's a period between two successive carvings. And here on the right-hand side, I'm going to write the equivalent uh, Days from carving to first cycle. Don't worry about that. Just for me to understand. That's the days from the cow carving to a first cycle, which would relate to, to 365 days if it was 80 days here. The average, more or less, the average gestation period, is, I think, is about 285 days. So if you add 285 to 80, you'll get 365. That's how I get that figure. Okay, so that's the equivalent intercarving period, and that would relate to. Um, the days from carving to first cycle without a first opportunity. I'll explain just now where I get that graph from. But prior to that, I just want to look at some figures here into carving periods so you understand what I'm talking about, how we have to correct them. Okay, we have a number of cows here. I'm going to identify them as A, B, A, B, C, D, E, and F. Okay, so the carving, the, the individual intercarving periods, I'm also going to write down in green. You can see that one is 425. In other words, the difference uh, between the first and second carving is 425 days. Um, this one here is 395. This one here is 365. This is also 365. As this one is 365. And this one is 325 days. Now if we just looked at intercarving period, obviously the shorter intercarving period would indicate the more fertile cow. So in this case here, we'd say that this cow is the most fertile. Everyone agree, in agreement, if we just look at those figures. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask someone with a calculator to, do, to help me do a calculation. And I'm going to give you the, the carving, the reproductive or fertility index of each individual cow. Remember what index is, 100 would be average, above 100 would be above average, and below it would be below average. So the first figure I'd like you to do is calculation for me is... Um, 395 divided by 425. 395 divided by 425. No, so it's 93. So she's got a fertility index of 93. This one is 100. This one is 100. This one is 100. Um, three, three, uh, 395 divided by 365. Okay. 
Um, 325 divided by 365. 89. And there you have it. The re red figures indicate the cow's uh, fertility index. How did you get that? Okay, I'll explain to you which, oh, okay. which, which cow is the most, uh, most fertile and uh, is genetically the most fertile cow. C, C obviously. Oh, okay. uh, and the one we thought was the most fertile is just average in terms of fertility. Okay, let me explain to you. For the first seven years of my ranching career, I never owned a bull. I just inseminated. Okay, so I knew, obviously, when a cow calved, and because I was inseminating, I was, I was looking, heat spotting, and I knew exactly how long it took for a cow to come and heat. And then I saw cows calving over different periods of the year. Those calving in the middle of the rainy season, the average cow only took 40 days to, to come and heat after calving. Whereas a cow that calved in the dry season, in your, in your winter here, would take 150, 160 days to cycle, the average cow. Okay. So that's exactly what I've done here. So what it means is that in my environment, more or less on average, for every day you carve closer to the mid-rainy season, to mid-July here, you would uh, decrease in the carving period by three quarters of a day. For every day. Can you repeat that? For every day you carved closer to the rainy season, to the green grass you decrease the intercarving period of that cow by three quarters of a day. That's a massive decrease. Every day, Every day closer, yes. Okay. In some environments, I've done it in, in uh, northern Zambia, where you have a very short season as well, um, very short period of good quality grazing, it was up to 0.9 of a day. So what that means is that if 0.9 of a day, if you have a 100 day, 100 day carving season, the average cow that carved on day one would only come and eat 10 days earlier than the average cow that carved on the last day. I'll repeat that. In that case, if you have a 100-day calving season, the, the cow calving, average cow calving on day one would only come and eat 10 days before the last cow that carved 100 days later. You understand that big, how big that influence is? Okay. Now, in our environment, because there are short rainy season, and the fast tropical growth of the grasses, nutrition is lost very quickly. We have that extremely uh, uh, positive relationship between date of calving related to the rainy season. In your environment, it won't exactly be as, uh, I'm talking about northern environments, yours it might be different as well here. Yeah. In some environments with better nutrition, like Missouri and places like that, it won't be, this graph won't have that uh, sharp curve. It'll be something like this. But you will still have that influence. What you're saying is that uh, in, in your environment, that the June... July? June, July is... No, January, your environment will be June. June, July. But your, your rainy season is when? Well, it's opposite. It would be January. So, January so would be equivalent why, to your July. Why is the cow that's so far away from your rainy season a better... Okay. You understand what this graph is? Okay, what this graph is, if you had 100 cows that carved over that period, okay, and you took, for every two weeks, you took the average of, say, 10 cows that carved in, in, uh, in this case, say, in July, in my environment, and you took the average in the carving period, you'd, have, you'd plot it up here. That would be the average. Let's look at it. Let's look at your environment here. Okay. What are the conditions like in, in December, January? in terms of nutrition. So this date here, this intercarving period, reflects, relates to the previous year's okay, carving that's date. That's what I was yes, yeah. Okay. okay, so let me explain that again. Uh, the, the date here relates to the first carving. So we have he heifers here that carve the first time and the second time. So the second carving will give you the intercarving period, but this date here refers to the first carving. Gotcha. Okay. I didn't get that. Yeah. Now what that means is that what are the conditions like in December, January when that cow calved? Very poor. Okay. So the average of those cows that calved that, that period would be somewhere around here, yeah, 385 days. But she had an intercalving period of 365 days. 
So what that means is that under exactly the same nutritional conditions, she was 20 days shorter. And that is why she's more fertile. Because that 20 days shorter relates to her inherent body condition and hormonal balance, which is genetics. Nothing to do with environment. So it's a, it's a similar environment. Similarly here, this cow here, that calved in your July, or June, July, and it took 40 days to cycle after calving. And if you had a bull in there, her intercalving period would be 325 days. But she has a 325 day period as opposed to 395 days here. They're equally efficient in terms of equally fertile, rather. Because this one carved in the line, this one also carved in the line. Because, it, because it's easier to rebreed in a good uh, nutrition when, when the grass is green than when it's dry. It's, it's, it's so common sense. Uh, you know, it's amazing. I, I published these results in 1982 for the first time. And no one has taken any notice of it. Because it's so out of uh, thinking, general thinking, that people just dismiss it, totally dismiss it. But it says that, that calving in the winter, yes. the full pushing on a string center, because it will be very costly, very inefficient, and the percentage of pregnancy rate will be lower. So what it means, in effect, is that you have a herd of cows and you arbitrarily decide I'm going to feed this cow much more than I'm going to feed that cow. So obviously that's going to affect the fertility. That's exactly what you're doing. Because this cow is carving at, a, at the time when the, you have poor nutrition, this cow is carving at optimum nutrition. And that is why they have uh, such a short uh, period from carving to first cycle. Okay, so that, that's the principle. In your environment, it won't be exactly the same the graph. It'll be a different graph. So, let's see, the, the hunter, not very different. If they're right on the average, that automatically gives them 100, is that right? If they're on the, on the line, it'll be 100, yes, they average. So what that means is that if you had, the way to do it, you can do it through a regression equation, which is a mathematical way of doing it. By a computer, you can do it. Or you can do it very simply and very accurately. If you, if you take your first two weeks of your carving season, the previous year's carving season, and look at the intercarving dates, and you plot a line in the graph here. You might put a dot there. Do it for a second. Eventually, you'll get, you'll get that curve. And I know from experience is that when you get down to this yard, down to 40 days, then it curves off, it flattens off. It doesn't go below. So the average cow, under ideal conditions, will come in heat 40 days after carving. Your better cows will take 20 days, 20 days after carving, they'll come and eat. And your poorest cow would only take 60 days after carving. And, and how did you get the numbers like 93 and 89? Which, uh... Okay, what you've done here, let me just go through it again. That is the individual carving, intercarving period for that cow. And you divided it Okay, what? you see that's the individual, okay? Now if you go down here, she carved then. So the average would be, on that graph there, would be 395. So we divided... Uh, 395 by 425. You see the average is 395, yeah? But she was 425. So she's poorer, so we used it the other way around. That's where you get the 93 from. The two very important things. One is to identify the most fertile cows, and the other one is to identify the most appropriate period to carve.